Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor for me to contribute to this anniversary here. I'm impressed by seeing the campus, as you said. I've, I'm here for the first time physically. I joined some online conferences here. That was already great, but now I'm here and it's nice to see the colleagues. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, um, I would like to speak about um, data, about urban technologies. So how can we use urban technology for city planning? And um, I would mainly focus on this notion of collaboration. And I enjoyed very much to listen also to Peter Messerly, the former speaker here, because I think we also try to change systems with data use, sharing data, fighting for open data policies. So how can you do that in city planning, but also in regional planning? I will mainly speak about cities, but it, it's, also, it's also about regions. I'm heading two city labs. One is the City Science Lab. It's a cooperation with MIT Media Lab. It's based in Hamburg. And the other one is a lab that is a cooperation with UN Habitat in Nairobi. It's, it's also based in Hamburg and in Nairobi. So we do work very, very locally on a very, very local scale. We call it a statistic unit. Sometimes we gather, collect and combine data from a building, a corner, a street, if you have a when, when we have a mobility problem or something like that. And we also work on a very, very global scale when, for example, we work in the informal settlements in a city like Lagos or um, in cities in South Africa. So there you have huge amounts of, like, people, land use, um, so we work very, very locally and very, very globally. So here you can see the City Science Lab. It's a very typical situation in our lab. We call ourselves a multi-stakeholder lab. So we are really um, scientists and also activists at the same time. So I think there is a huge gap between talking and making, and we are trying to close that gap every day. So we are really to, we try to be transformative in our lab. We are setting up um, city scopes. You can see here one of the city scope, and we try to engage people to work with us and to get them into scenario planning. We are seed funded by the city of Hamburg, and I say that because I think that if we really want to change systems and if we really want to create impact as scientists, um, we have to be connected to the government of a city, to the government of a country. For us, it's always very important to get support by the government, otherwise we won't create that impact. We also work a lot with civil society, NGOs, so grassroots activists, but the connection between the government and the grassroots activists, I think that's the crucial point. And this connection very often is still, still very weak. So why a city lab? I don't know if you have city labs here in Lausanne, Geneva. A city lab is good because we are a university, we are a public funded university, but it's a free space. So we are not a company, we don't want to sell products and we are not a political party. So we don't, don't have a political agenda in mind. We are researchers and we are a bit more neutral and we, we offer this experimental space to the city, to employees of the city, to the mayor, to the state secretaries. A lot of different people from the city come to the city lab when they want to, want to think out of the box, when they want to get out of their offices. It's sometimes very good to be in another space and a university is a very good space for that. So I think this is already a kind of like role that we can play as scientists, that we can offer this space. Um, when I say collaboration, we collaborate in between civil society, science, economy and politics. We also collaborate with companies. Uh, at the moment we are doing a project with Google. It calls AirView, so collecting air data and talk about uh, how, to, um, how to increase air quality. Um, but that's sometimes difficult also for us because I think the companies, they, have to, they come to cities, but they also have to make the data open to the citizens and not only keep the data for the companies. Um, here you can see our research field, our action fields, multi-stakeholder collaboration. Like I said, I think sometimes our, the tools that we are setting up, they are not really rocket science. It's a lot about mapping, it's a lot about visualizing data, it's about making the data interactive. But rocket science is maybe the way of how we introduce the, the um, technology to the society, how we link them to governance processes, and how we make them run in a city. 
Because from, me, from my point of view, we have a lot of technology. That's not the point. The point is how, who uses the technology and how, and how can this technology create impact. And we also know that there is so much technology around that doesn't create any impact because it's too complicated. It's not open to the, to the people. Modeling, of course, modeling complex system. I've heard the notion of digital twins already several times since yesterday. I know that you are also involved in that. And also narrative and interfaces, like I said, how do you visualize the data? How do you make the data accessible? Um, of course, there are a lot of conflict lines in city and city planning. So our work is also to maintain and to curate and democracy because there's a lot of populism also going on in city planning. People want, want very simple solutions and a city is not simple. A city is complex. So we try to explain people how complex a city is. Of course, we have a lot of data. That's not so new. New is that we had a, have a lot of uh, new linkage opportunities. And to be honest, I think there are not so many softwares at the moment uh, who l that linked links data in a good way for a city. I mean, we have this for companies, when you think of softwares like SAP or something like that, but for cities, it's still a little more difficult because we, um, we operate with a lot of very, very heterogeneous data that still goes from an Excel spreadsheet to an elaborated urban data platform. So cities are very, very virus, and this is why it is so difficult to connect a city data sometimes in a good way. So what are we doing? We create this database collaborative tools. And I give you some examples. I don't go into technical details. We have done this project uh, to find um, spaces for um, refugees. You remember that winter 2014-15 when so many refugees came to Europe. You remember that Angela Merkel, our former chancellor, she wanted to took them all. Uh, we, we, wir können es schaffen, this famous sentence from her. And then there was a lot of um, pol political discussions. Emotions were high. People, uh, we, we didn't have space for all the refugees. Hamburg, the city of Hamburg took, took 40,000 people within four months. So the speed was very high. And then we set up a city scope and we discussed with the citizens of Hamburg where to place, where to localize all the people. And that was really a citizen engagement process. Very simple tool. And you see here also that we use Lego bricks. We also like to work in a very analog way with people so that people like the tools, they can touch it. And it's not only, we also work a lot with touch screens, of course, but using sometimes analog objects is also something that is very important. I show this building as a picture again, not because Olaf Scholz is now our chancellor. We have known that uh, during that times because he, he used to be the mayor of Hamburg. But again, to emphasize that it's important that we, we have this government support, because when you set up such a process about uh, refugee accommodation, it's clear, I think, that you need that support from the government. Otherwise, people won't come and discuss this, and it wouldn't, it, it, uh, the city probably wouldn't have taken it that serious. Crucial for all the work we do, in it, wherever we go, every city in the world, is that we first thing is always we ask, do you have an urban data platform? How does your urban data management system look like? Do you have a kind of master portal? Do you have standards of how to use data? Uh, is there a possibility for us to make the data interoperable? And this is very, very different. Some Cities have good open data platforms, others have not. I know also here in Switzerland that there are differences between Zurich and Geneva. And this is, um, yeah, I think cities should invest a lot of money in setting up this urban data management systems, but because then you can start to create cockpits, dashboards, digital twin projects, everything. Citizen engagement, of course, is something that is very important. This is how it looked like in the past. It was very analog and it is still very analog. Today, it looks like that. We have a lot of um, data that is created um, via mobile phone or also the touch screens. And in uh, digital pa participation, for example, we use machine learning now. We use a kind of natural language processing to cluster all the comments from the citizens because they are getting more and more. And it's difficult for us now because we have so many uh, comments from the citizens. Uh, how can we evaluate them? And this is now a, a big research topic. How can we do that, for example, with natural uh, language processing? Um, 
we are also setting up a digital twin for the city. I mean, the digital twin technology comes from industry. You know that well here. Here are a lot of engineers. But when you want to set up a twin for a city, it's a very, very complex system. We are doing this with Munich and Leipzig. It's a long-term project. And um, for us, a digital twin of a city is, first of all, to extend our urban data platform again, because this is crucial. And then we said that we don't want to make one twin of a city because that's not possible. We do several twins. And we are setting up at the moment different technical tools for setting up the twin. And a twin in our uh, idea is not so much having data visualized in a 3D model, we also do that, but much more what the question of what kind of data do we have to put into a twin to represent a city in a good way. And it, it of course comes up that then we know that there is a lot of data that is not there. So we also lack of, of data also in a high-tech city like Hamburg. So we set up um, data, uh, data uh, tools for data collection. Huh? For example, micromobility is something. We don't have a lot of data about micromobility. We know a lot about uh, mobility. We have a lot of mobility data, but how, um, for example, during the pandemic, people did care mobility, taking care of kids, taking care of um, of older people, of sick people. We don't have maps about this, so we set up a tool now for collecting those kind of data, and then we model them, and then we are trying to set up the twin. Huh? So you see that a twin for us is also very much coming from city planning and the question of is, is what kind of data is represented in the city that we want to have in the digital twin. So we go one step back first and ask this. Um, and also we are doing a lot of um, like transmedia work. Um, especially in city planning, co-creation with citizens and author, also with experts has a lot to do with rooms, with perception of a city. And we do this pr project, for example, it's about creating a park in Hamburg. It's a, a huge park area in the city of Hamburg. And we do it with citizens so they can use the glasses, go into the virtual world and collaborate in the virtual world. And that's also a very nice project. You see that people who like to game, they are very fast with this, and other people, um, they get dizzy uh, while they put on the glasses. So this is also a process um, that we have to go through so that people get used to plan the city in the, virtu in the virtual world. Um, another um, project which is very important and one of our biggest projects at the moment, and I know that this is, this, is an, um, this is a topic for a lot of regions and cities in the world, is the question of how to combine city data. And we have done uh, this project, the t title is COSI, or we call it also CODA, Connecting Data, Connecting Urban Data, is a web-based software that we created in an agile way, so we work with um, employees of the city to test, to test it. And I would like to hand over here to my colleague Daniel Schulz. He's our tech head in the City Science Lab, and he's explaining the software and how this works in a very uh, short um, video take. It's, it's about a minute. The basic idea of COSI, the cockpit for social infrastructure, is to provide a web-based geoinformation system that draws in real time from the urban data platform and gives access to information for urban planning. It is not a program that in the end prints out the optimal solution for urban planning through algorithmic processing. Rather, it provides insights and opportunities to work with the data at different stages of a project's development and in particular to test different solutions through collaborative work. To achieve this flexibility in the application, the tool has three main functionalities. Visualization, analysis and simulation. Prior to COSI, planners in Hamburg had to approach each district administration individually to request the data they needed for their plans. At the same time, administrations had become very cautious about growing privacy concerns and legal issues. COSI aims to network the data needed and prepared for better access and quick analysis, especially for social planning. Thus, as a city planner, you can easily access the latest city data through COSI. 
responsibility for these data sets is clearly defined. Errors can be reported to the appropriate parties. Thus, the retrieved data becomes a trusted source and very valuable to generate knowledge for planning purposes. Yeah. Uh, Johanna and Daniel, two of the developers in the project, you can see that this is something that makes life for a planner much easier now. He or she does not have to ask for so many data for um, like decision, um, data-based decision making. So decisions very, very often are very emotionally <laughs> in city planning. And now they have the, the possibility to uh, connect the data via this platform, and they can also simulate uh, very, very simple calculations. This is also nice. They can now say, look, what, what would happen if we put a school in this district? Or do we need more green spaces when there is a residential housing project in, the, in, in this district? Very, very simple questions, and it, but it's used well, and a lot of people like that. And the next step is now for us, and this is for me now transformative research, that we roll out uh, capacity training for the employees of the city of Hamburg. That's not only us who do it, but we have partners because we have now 200 people using, using it and now we need, of course, the city of Hamburg is, is far bigger and now we set up a capacity training program for employees to use that. Yeah, data-based collaboration, that was my uh, crucial, is my, uh, my, my mission or my um, appeal to all of us. What is it when we summarize it? I really go for this multi-stakeholder approach. So we have to overcome the data silos. Uh, this is always easily said, but we know that it's very difficult in reality. Um, not only universities have their data silos, also uh, city governments have a lot of data silos, but those softwares that I presented you and also other solutions give us the opportunity now to share data like never before. This is really new. Then I think it's very important to include citizen data. Uh, also, this is something I know that a lot of cities, regions, countries work with citizen data. But when you specifically look at how those data is preceded, then you see very often that those data is not connected to the urban data platform. It stays in a grassroots project, and this doesn't make any sense. We have to connect the urban data platforms to citizen data. Then, like I said, connecting data is something which is very creative and very still new. There are a lot of other options how you can connect data. Collaborative mapping. Uh, especially when we work in developing countries like in Africa or also Latin America. First of all, we have to collect data and we have to map data. Then co-designing the city is a collaborative process. I showed this with the Parcom project using um, virtual reality, using augmented reality, using game elements is something that we have to work with. And then in the digital twin discussion now, the city-to-city -city collaboration gets stronger. Also the region-to-city collaboration and the country-to-country -country collaboration. I mean, when we get it rolling that Europe, and this is a hard, I know it's difficult, get like a, an idea of how they would standardize their data, then of course countries can also collaborate in a better way. And that's not only a Chinese and an Asian issue, which is, which is a now actually. So we just wrote a book about this. Um, it, it just come, comes out the next day. The title is The Digital City, Creating Data for All Our Urban Collaboration. And in this book, we go a little deeper to all those um, technologies. How do we do this? How do we set up the, the teams? And um, how do we use uh, the, the tools? Just one sentence or two sentences, and then I'm ending to this um, UN lab. Actually, what we are doing in, with the United Nations is exactly the same thing that we have done with the City Science Lab for Hamburg, for Germany, and for Europe, because the UN one day came to the City Science Lab and said, that's great what you do here. Could we have this also for the United Nations? Because globally spoken, we have huge cities. We know that the big cities will emerge in Africa. I mean, Lagos is supposed to be one of the biggest cities in the world um, in the future. We have so many problems. Could you help us with the tools to organize cities in a better way? Because when you go to the Global South, you have more images like that one. I took that picture last week in Buenos Aires. And um, there, of course, we have a lack of data very often. And the first thing we have to do there is connecting data. 
And we do work in very um, in different countries in the world, uh, a lot in Africa. We are setting up urban management system. Also, citizen engagement is very important in the global south. We have a lot of countries they are trying to set up their democracies. We get a lot of requests from African countries because governments want to speak to the citizens. And uh, we also have a lot of environmental and climate issues now. And we are setting up those tools also for, for cities in the global south. And there again, it's not, we don't transfer our technology to African countries. First of all, we set up good teams, collaborations. We see who could be responsible then for the tool. We just handed over a tool to Durban, uh, Etiquini in South Africa. It's an algorithm that counts um, land use for an informal settlement. And there we have a GIS department in the government of Etiquini who now runs the system and that's great this is how we can work and this is I think also how we can create impact and uh, I know and this is my last sentence um, for a lot of young researchers it's easy for us we are quite like established researchers it's easy for us to say look you have to go out with your research you have to be interdisciplinary you have to um, to have to follow the multi-stakeholder approach I know that the young researchers they really have to focus on their disciplines they have to publish they have to write their PhDs and on the other hand I constantly push them to go out and we struggle this every day in our research lab. I always tell them, look, you, you, have, to, you, you have quiet time to do research, to do, to, do, to go deep into an issue, but you also have to do the other thing. And I really go for this multi-stakeholder approach, and I really like to create that impact. And I think scientists have a very important role in that new decade that we call a transformative one. And data is, is super crucial and one of the hearts of making things um, happen. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, please, uh, you can sit down. We'll start the round table with a Mentimeter survey, as we did before this morning. Um, I call the panelist, <laughs> Olga Fink, uh, Amir Rezai, and Julia Velti. Yes. Yeah, and first we'll, uh, we'll ask to you this question. Can we uh, send the slide with a Mentimeter question? Uh, you know how to do it. You take your smartphone. And you answer the question, what are the obstacles to the use of digital tools in general ah. for transformation of territories and cities? A lack of information on their potential, a lack of trained personnel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the costs and the fear of surveillance, uh, the GAFAM often have the, you know, <laughs> control of this data, which is, which might be scary. Uh, yes, well, indeed. Then I will ask the panelists to have a first reaction mm. to your uh, opinion, perception of the problem. Okay, wow. Okay, 10 seconds left, and then we'll uh, start. Uh, I will ask Olga Fink. <laughs> you are a professor here at uh, ENAC to comment on that. And uh, then I will ask Amir Rezai, and then uh, you, Gila, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Olga Fink, what, what do you think? I mean, that, that it seems to be... Uh, it, it looks a bit surprising, but it it's also has been, I believe, one of the reasons why several of the smart city projects um, have had some difficulties as well. Uh, but for example, lack of trained uh, lack of trained personnel. Uh, you mentioned this that this is important to involve the city planners um, and to bring them to the level to to use the tools. Um, so it coincides also with a lot of the points that, um, that you raised. 
but possibly some of the points were also not uh, listed as, uh, as some of the um, answering options. Um, for example, collaboration has been also uh, what, what you pointed out, but also collaboration between big tech companies uh, and governments and uh, um, um, startups possibly as well. Okay, uh, Amir Reza, you, you are the CEO uh, of a Swiss Inspect, so you, you, it's a startup. So you, you have first-hand experience of acceptance of those, those new tools. Can you, you know, give, you your, give us your, your opinion, your analysis of this uh, survey, the results of this survey? Well, um, to be honest, I will not choose any of these options, <laughs> in particular when it comes to construction and civil engineering. Um, because in the construction and civil industry, uh, we are dealing with long processes. And the reason that we are dealing with these long processes is because we are confronted with safety issues, with the safety of people. So it doesn't mean that we are not open to new digital tools or kind of new technologies, but it takes time because all these new technologies and new tools need to be tested, validated properly, so that we can use them uh, also in practice. Um, in particular, when it comes to the data analytic solutions, uh, I think um, we are not going to, let's say, throw away or forget what we have learned until now, what we have built until now, based on solid uh, science, based on solid physics fundamentals. And since there are more data available, we completely shift to data analytic solutions. For me, the added value comes when we combine the two. What we have uh, learned, for example, what we have built based on physics, and what we can also build using these data analytics tools, um, using, for example, machine learning. And I think as uh, we, as civil engineers, environmental engineers, architects, who are the leader and the pioneers for this digital transformation, we should create a collaborative environment that everybody with different backgrounds, including computer science and data science, al can also contribute. But we must guide them so that we can also leverage from their expertise, but also in the end create a tool that is useful for the society and citizens um, and also a kind of respect or meets our requirements as well. Julia? Uh, Velti, you are a student uh, and you chose uh, in um, um, environmental uh, engineering, but you chose a minor in data science. Yes. Um, so w w what is your reaction when you see the result of the survey? Um, I haven't worked in this field uh in the industry, so I don't really know, but as a student I would say that maybe there is a lack of information on their potential because as an environmental engineer, for now we don't have a lot of uh, classes or information on how to use data science in our uh, field. It's something that's relatively new. And this year they actually redid the the masters, so I'm not part of it, but now it's All much right. more focused on, on data sciences and digital stuff. So here is a, a good point to be discussed uh, later on with the uh, deans of uh, ENAC. Yes. <laughs> you, uh, you, you would like more courses and... They did it, actually. I'm uh, just not part of the new okay. class. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, uh, Zimmer, what, what, what is your reaction? Yeah, I, I mean, I comment on this fears of uh, threat to the private sphere because this is quite high. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mo most of the people asked. The, this is, of course, an issue. Uh, we had a. I give you a story. It happened last week. We we set up for. I said that for Etiquini, which is former Durban in South Africa, we called it an AI building tracker. AI building tracker, and it was, uh, we worked with satellite images, we created an algorithm that counts the informal settlements of Etequini. So the government, they didn't know where they go, how much land they took, and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a super simple algorithm. And they, um, we, didn't, we were not allowed anymore to use the title AI building tracker, because it <laughs> sounds like uh, AI is bad and 
a tracker, monitoring systems are also bad because people, um, they fear of lacking privacy. Mm. So you have to be very, very cautious with this. Huh? And um, of, then we gave them another title because this was absolutely not about, um, about harming private spheres because we only, use, we only count the rooftops of the informal settlements. It's not about people. And I mean, I always um, try to motivate, or I mean, this is important that cities um, govern their data. We don't have to leave this only to companies. I mean, cities have to have an urban data platform. And if they have it, and if the city is under a democratic control, then of course you can also protect uh, private issues. And in, I think in Europe we have quite good laws <laughs> to protect um, privacy. We are not allowed to use a lot of data. Um, but when you go to other countries, data protection is far lower. I mean, go to the US and also in Asian countries, you can do nearly, nearly everything. You can get nearly every data about everything. And that's, that's a very um, cultural, it's a historical question about, about what kind of data laws we have. But uh, of course, we have to take that into account and be very cautious. Well, thank you. Well, the tools you presented before, that, that's a type of tools. Uh, but there are other tools, and I would like first Olga uh, Fink to explain what you're doing in your lab and what kind of tools you are developing. And, and same for you, uh, uh, Amir. Uh, what, what is Swiss Inspect, you know, offering in terms of technology service? So first, Olga. Um, we are working on developing um, machine learning and also um, hybrid algorithms where we combine physics-based and machine learning algorithms um, that take condition monitoring data, so um, data that is um, collected on um, complex systems and infrastructure systems. Um, and our goal is um, to, to detect um, faulty conditions but then also to distinguish between different faulty conditions, so really to guide what needs to be done, um, and ultimately also to predict when something is going to happen. Um, and we look into different systems, um, such as, for example, um, railway systems, um, to provide informed decisions and to um, schedule maintenance only when it's required, and not uh, when, when it's scheduled. C can you tell us about specific examples for you working with the SBB, the CFF? Uh. Yes, the, um, this is one of our projects, uh, and uh, the goal there is uh, to monitor the, um, the railway wheel. Um, and it may sound uh, kind of a rather simple system, um, but it's one of the systems that is actually the most expensive on, their, um, on, on the train. Um, and it's monitored not from the um, train itself, but from the infrastructure. So we are getting information from um, different types of sensors. Um, and the question is, uh, when um, does the wheel um, deviate uh, from their um, normal condition? Um, and how long can we still use it um, so that it's um, um, safe, um, still safe and um, to travel, but also cost efficient to travel? Um, and, and interestingly, the type of sensors that we are using have actually been used for something else. Uh, they were used to, um, to monitor if, there, um, if the um, freight, uh, freight wagons actually, their freight is balanced or not. So the idea was to use the, uh, the type of sensors for something else and, um, and to monitor the, um, the wheel conditions. Swiss Inspect. Yeah. Um, let me, for the sake of completeness, let me begin or start with the problem that we are trying to solve and also the solution that Swiss, Inspe Swiss Inspect is also proposing. Well, um, currently, infrastructure managers or operators, they need to do regular inspection to ensure the structural safety of assets. For example, the case of bridges, tunnels, dams, road networks. At the moment, these inspections are done visually, meaning that uh, engineers go on site, um, take some notes, take some images, and then back in the office, they provide and prepare these inspection reports. But there are two main kind of problems with this current approach. And one is that it's quite subjective. Depending on the level of the exper experience or expertise of the engineer, depending on the environmental condition of the day that they do the inspection, the op uh, they all affect inspectors' opinion whether, for example, to document the damage or not, and also the severity of the damage. The other problem is that this process is not really traceable. 
So we cannot really trace or quantify how the damage, for example, cracks, grow from one inspection to the other in a quantitative way. So at Swiss Inspect, uh, what we are developing and what we are offering um, is an image-based pipeline where, which is enabled by AI and physics to create a structural digital twins. And what I mean by a structural digital twins, uh, they are kind of a digital repli replica of an asset that contains several layers of information. They're starting from the geometry, um, information about the damage, different types of damage we detect using AI, the severity and the type of the damage, and also more importantly, how those damage grows over time from one inspection to the other. So at the end, the infrastructure manager or infrastructure owner will have this kind of digital replica or digital twin or a structural digital twin and that, that they can use in order to plan their, maintain, uh, their intervention and also um, maintain their assets over the, its lifetime. Do, Julia, do, do you see working for Swiss Inspect in the future? <laughs> Would you like to work for them? Uh, yeah, Interesting. Sure. <laughs> I don't know, yes, maybe. <laughs> it could be something interesting. I don't know yet exactly what I'm going to do. Have so you chosen your, your, the, the, the topic of your master uh, uh, thesis? thesis uh, no, it? not yet, because I, I still have another year of classes to do. So I'm focusing on the different classes to see if I can discover a new topic that interests me. So far, I have mainly done the... Mandatory classes. Mandatory so. classes. Okay, uh, Olga and, and Amir, you, you, you talked about pretty uh, <laughs> complex stuff, pretty. Uh, but you are also a member of an association called Fustic. And, and I, I would like you to go uh, to explain what Fustic is and why you engage in, in Fustic. Per perhaps, uh, Amir, uh, because it, it shows the uh, importance to go into multi-stakeholder, uh, uh, a multi-stakeholder approach to those problems. Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, let's say, in terms of digitalization or digital transformation is the management of this ecosystem. Yeah, perhaps few stick, it was launched. When, when was it launched and I think by whom? And, 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 uh, yeah, Fustic. It's, it's a spin-off of EPFL, I think, Yes, right? um, it's a spin-off of EPFL um, from ENAC. Yeah. So, Professor Binder, uh, uh, of course, is one of, the, one of the members and also Dr. Dreyer. Um, well, the main purpose of this association is really to tackle climate change from a transdisciplinary uh, uh, approach, point of view, right? Yes, but of course, at the same time, also to bring together all playmakers in this field, yeah. from uh, public sectors, private sectors, NGOs, uh, startups, so also a platform that solution, uh, let's say seekers, can also uh, find the, the solution providers, for example, like Swiss Inspect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On Fustic, you are a member of Fustic as well. You'll have your uh, general assembly later on today, so <laughs> tell us about this very nice initiative. Yeah, I believe it's a quite unique initiative bringing all these interdisciplinary fields together, mm -hmm. but not just from the academic perspective, but also um, both public players and also companies and to, to enable them to um, start projects together and to have kind of uh, uh, well, short ways and short um, or, or possibly also um, enabling finding the right um, p uh, the right partners for for the projects, but also push faster and to act faster to be agile. I believe this is also why it was um, started as an association um, to enable all these um, well, fast movements and and um, starting projects, um, bringing people together, having discussions, workshops um, on all interdisciplinary topics. Thank you. To, to go back, and then we'll open a discussion with the floor. Uh, to go back to the more general question, uh, the question uh, for this roundtable is how to take advantage of digital tools for a responsible transformation of ter territories and cities. Um, uh, uh, Professor Zimmer, uh, where are we at? Which stage are we? 
in the use of those tools uh, in Europe. Let's say in, in Europe. I think we, we, are, we are highly developed in tech, tech skills and tech tools. I'm sure that in your lab or institute there is a lot of high, high developed tech going on, but we are not, not very well developed in how to make use out of it and how to bring this to people that it really creates an impact. I think this interface is still still quite weak. But who, who and I'm. I, w can I say something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you study, Julia. You study here um, data analytics. Or no, what is the title of your environmental science and engineering? And I find it so important that we have interdisciplinary education also at the universities. You do. Uh, coding, uh, computer analytics probably, or data analytics, but you should also have like sociology, philosophy, societal sciences. I don't know if you have that in your program, but it's so important and I'm constantly looking for creative coders, com creative computer scientists, <laughs> and they are very, very rare. <laughs> we are still failing for finding professors. We have, I, I, I experienced this several times, then we published professorships at this interface, they don't come. We have the computer scientists, they are great, and we have the city planners, they are also great. But the interface is like not there in Europe, to be honest, because we don't educate the people, or not, not enough. So it this, look, it looks this is like a point. job offer. <laughs> <laughs> um, this Daniel that I showed here, huh, this computer scientist, he's a coder, a heavy coder. And then he had to go into this agile process of setting up use cases with the employees of the city of Hamburg. And you can imagine that they're sitting someone, she, she said, look, I have this problem, I have a PDF file here, how can I get super simple questions? And they drove him mad at the beginning. He was super crazy, he wanted to stop, but then he went through this and now he created this great tool, which is highly requested by all the cities. They want that because it's so, uh, the need is so clear. And that's great. And this is, I think, how we, when we talk of smart cities, I don't like that notion of smart cities. I don't use that. We need like uh, meaningful use cases. Use case generating is a very, very crucial thing. And a lot of people are not able to create meaningful use cases.